How was your day? Not bad. Not bad. Um, been doing some, setting up some new premiere um, profiles and stuff to be making some of these edits a little faster for different shows that I'm doing now. Nice. We, we appreciate it. So I'm doing these podcasts that I released originally in 2014. That I'm going Whoa. back. And doing, so. How many different shows? Pr- promote yourself real quick before we run into our show, into, into continuing conversations. But how many different type of shows are you producing right now? Right now, just two, but I've got a couple on the works. I'm working on a documentary that is uh, for one of the old, um, uh, like, sideway, highway um, tourist traps at a place called Irish Hills, Michigan. Um, they used to have, like, a dinosaur park and a bunch of other stuff like that. We're get, getting ready to do a documentary on that. Mm. Um, other than that, I do, I'm, I'm re-releasing episodes of an old show I did called Geek Feed. Um, and then there's another one called The Quest, which was all about gaming. It's actually what got me into the gaming podcast scene originally. Um, doing interviews with gamers and, and designers and stuff like that. So that was a lot of fun. And those are all old shows that are, you know, I'm just sitting on them right now. So I'll bring them back out and see what happens with them. So, but I'm doing, I'm doing the production for this show and another show called um, Against Boredom, which is uh, well, not you're, coming out as fast as I would like. Well, you're missing <laughs> your Star Trek stream live stream too. Yeah, that's true. That's currently on hold because we're in a mid-season break, but we will be back shortly. Um, I've been writing up season three, and I'm looking forward to being able to get back to playing that. I really like playing the Star Trek live streams. I think it's a lot of fun. Cool. You have a good crew. I listen to it in the background while I'm working. <laughs> so just hearing it, the game mechanics and how you're employing them, I, I like it. Poorly most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Are people having fun? That's my rule. Did they walk away having fun? Then you did your job, right? Cool. That's right. All right. Well, let's get rolling. Uh, This is another continuing conversations. I'm Michael Dismuke. I'm a freelance writer for Star Trek Adventures RPG, along with a blogger on continuing missions, which is the number one RPG site or site for uh, uh, Star Trek Adventures RPG. And today we have two amazing guests with us. Let's start with Jim Johnson. He's a co-host. He's not a guest. (laughs) I should just get slapped. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I I could just be a guest tonight. uh, Hey, everybody. Uh, Jim Johnson, I am the project manager and line editor for the Star Trek Adventures RPG, published by Medifius Entertainment, low these many years. I am co-host on this year's show. Uh, even though Michael wants me to be a guest tonight, I am, in fact, a co-host, such as it is, uh, on this show. So happy to be here, as always, with you, Michael. And uh, we have a special guest tonight, uh, the esteemed Jeff. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Jeff Harvey. I am also known as Studio, Studio Tembo. Um, I have a lot of content creation stuff going on if you're watching this you probably have seen at least uh this show that i produce um you can also find me at all the places at studio tembo uh there's a link tree in all of the show notes uh that you do so you can find me on tiktok and twitter and twitch and there's a lot of stuff coming out a lot of content i'm working on that is star trek adjacent and uh, a lot of content that is not star trek related at all that's coming out on the studio tembo channels in the near future so um, yeah I, we, we've uh, said it before i oh, go ahead go ahead no, i'm good no, I just say we said it before. We would not be here without you. So everyone, if you like continuing conversations, this is the backbone. Studio Tempo Jeff Harvey is the backbone of it because I do not have the skills to do what he does for us. So we always truly appreciate all your work on that, Jeff. Absolutely. I enjoy doing it. So fantastic all right well we are talking about all those different types of roles today um for everyone who knows and been tuning in for the past couple of weeks we've been been talking about the different roles of star trek uh starting with the doctor then we went to the captain uh went through everybody and there's a role we didn't cover and that's all the other roles we might have seen on the ship because we've been hearing more about players out there choosing to play non well let's call them non-standard roles um, i have behind me you know naomi wildman if if any of you know her from star trek voyager one of my favorite characters and there's not an episode that she wasn't in that i didn't love um and there were some she even had a couple episodes where she got to star in and she was kind of a central character in it and and I, to this day, wonder where she is serving in Starfleet. I, I imagine that she went into um, Starfleet Academy at some point, her and Icheb, and probably were buddies as they were working through their way through the... <laughs> the if, for you who aren't tuning in, Jim started bawling when I said Icheb. Um, so so let's talk. I, I'm curious to hear, hear what who your favorite characters are that were not 
commissioned officers um, and maybe some side characters who were regulars on the show that to give examples of some of the non-player roles, non, excuse me, the non uh, commissioned roles that people could play. Uh, let's start with you, Jeff. Uh, my favorite is probably Rom uh, from DS9. Um, although, of course, Guinan being the first one to really see a lot of uh, Guinan is pretty amazing. But I think Rom had the the best character arc of all the characters uh, um, as far as non main cast. Of the, he was a lot of fun. So. Totally. I mean, he he went from being scrubbing and uh, yeah, server and janitor basically in minor repair to being yeah. a grand Nagus. So right. <laughs> that's quite a character arc over seven years. Right. And he started out as the typical Ferengi, the, the, the growling and the sniveling and all the other stuff. And of course, he's one of the same actors that was the, one of the original, original Ferengi. But right. um, I really like the the story arc you see from him at the union uh, and all the other stuff that he does. I think it's a lot of fun to, to watch that. And I think it's a good example of a way to take a character that is non-commissioned, non-Starfleet and, and watch their progression um, in a non-typical way. I think it's a lot of fun. Well, good example, Jim. I was I was gonna go with uh, with uh, with Nog, so I guess they, they kept it in the family, right? That that yeah. that 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 pair of characters like Nam and Rog, they uh, Rom and <laughs> Nog, uh, had both of them had significant character arcs throughout their uh, throughout the series, and uh, I mean clearly, Rom had the ended up at the pinnacle, right? He, he became Grand Negus, of course, uh, right. but you know, don't don't uh, don't sleep on on Nog, right? He went from uh, a sniveling Ferengi kid, you know, up to no good and getting into trouble and uh, having uh, run-ins with the law and uh, joined Starfleet, got commissioned as an officer, became a war veteran, uh, you know, and, and and moved on from there. And then, you know, if you follow secondary canon, he becomes a captain. Um, okay. so, uh, so, I mean, both both those characters, great character arcs. Uh, I think, uh, I think Guinan, I'll, I'll echo Jeff and say Guinan was probably like the good first example of a non Starfleet character that can have a lot to do in a show. Um, and I think I took it to the next level. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, I think we can stick with DS nine for a bit because they made it gold um, having non Starfleet officers, whether it's constable Odo, who was a major reoccurring character, Quark, a bartender who was in every single episode, played a pretty major role in every episode. Go to Elam Garrick, who really toward the end, a shopkeeper who, who esp- slash espionage agent. And even if it was people like Keiko, O'Brien's wife, she she came out as a teacher, right? And had some interesting episodes. And even though I loathe to say it, Kai Wynn. Kai Wynn, um, it makes my skin tingle every time I say her name. Um, but again, look at these characters who who became regulars and loved characters showing really how expansive Star Trek Adventures can be too if you have a game master who's collaborating with you on creating these stories. Yeah, not I to would mention, say Kai Wynn. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was going to say not to mention Morn, right? <laughs> Think about taking Morn and making Morn a player character or at least yeah. a supporting character, right? He He's in every episode and, the, and then they even gave him an episode, right? He got that, that whole episode on, uh, you know, that was kind of connected to him and stuff. So... Uh, oh. He just um, got his moment on uh, uh, Lower Decks. That's right. So. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't you say TNG, though? You mentioned Guinan, but wouldn't you say Wesley Crusher would be the first example of a non-commissioned officer regular role on the show as a child? Yeah, actually, you're right. Yeah, the only issue with that is that that's what he was going for, was to be a commissioned officer. He was still kind of in the Starfleet ecosphere of that. Um, mm-hmm. Like, certainly he wasn't uh he wasn't starfleet but he was doing everything he could to be starfleet that was kind of his aspiration mm-hmm. okay okay and then we go over to voyager and we have some pretty great examples three that stick out on my mind um of characters which would be neelix kess and of course seven of nine who was never a commissioned officer um, but played major roles on the show stop shaking your head jim at me <laughs> oh man I always liked Neelix. Um, I thought, Neelix <laughs> was, I thought Kess had a lot of potential, but I never, I never actually saw how that ended. I didn't, I didn't watch a ton of Voyager. I watched, I shouldn't say that. I've seen everything on Voyager, but I didn't memorize a lot of Voyager. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah, I guess, I guess you really can't count Chakotay and Balana and Paris, right? Because they were former Starfleet and, and then and then came back to it. So I was mm-hmm. thinking about the Maquis kind of connection. So I guess yeah, maybe maybe Seska, but. Um, 
Uh, Neelix and Kess and uh, and Seven certainly are different. Different more uh, examples more in line with what we're, we're what we're what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Neelix is a good example. Yeah. So as we've been as we've been doing these shows too, it seems like every time we're riffing on every type of character. We talked like, for instance, as for first officers, that a first officer doesn't necessarily need to be a commissioned officer. If, for instance, um, they have a special role to play. We think about Kira Norris, um, who was a Bajoran uh, major. She was a major in the Bajoran uh, forces who worked under Cisco. And then also there could be special times when a first officer is appointed for a special mission um, in order to accomplish something. I think Discovery kind of had that a feel with Michael Berman, who was removed from duty, but then miraculously ends up a first officer, right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, said. A of, there's a lot of potential with, with being able to, uh, to fit non-standard characters into positions. Like I think one thing you can also do is if you've got a character that's... Uh, an archaeologist or something and you're moving into a, a region of space where you've got a lot of archaeological things that are gonna be done you can have this character move in with some special authority that they would have over the ship's uh direction um you know they're on a special mission the marcus Kara, uh carol marcus kind of thing you know she's mm-hmm. she's in charge of this one specific project and she can kind of direct the ship and how to how to do things um reliant because of her disposal sort of thing mm-hmm. so we can think of a lot of examples. The Zach Dorn and TNG that was running the tactical exercises yeah. played a major role. And, and so honestly, I think that if you're a player and you want to rotate through a lot of roles, each starship has a mission each episode, right? And so maybe finding ways to bring out non-commissioned officers um, and other kind of characters into that role could be some creative ways. Do you think supporting characters play into this too? Uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think there's uh, there, there's no reason. I mean, in fact, this is encouraging the game to make a, make some supporting characters and then call them up as needed and bring them into the show. Right. So I think, um, you know, probably O'Brien is a good example of a supporting character who was used a lot throughout next gen. And then probably some player said, oh, I really like O'Brien. I want to I want to play him in a new campaign. And uh, and they went they did DS9 and they brought him over to DS9 and and promoted them and, uh, and gave them more to do. And, and, you know, they filled out the character sheet, right. They finished all the, all the other stats and added more values and stuff. But uh, I mean, uh, I mean, we, there's lots of examples like O'Brien in the series. I think O'Brien's a good, a good, well-rounded example. Cause they kept adding stuff to him, like not just his name and his first name, but they gave him a wife and they gave him a kid. And then they gave him the, mm-hmm. uh, what was it? What I, I just blanked on what instrument he plays the cello, right? Play O'Brien cello? plays an yeah. instrument. He does. He plays. Uh, I think he plays the cello. Um, I may have to go back and. Uh, I remember I'll, seeing an episode. I don't remember playing anything in any episodes, but yeah, they oh, they do a lot of the grind, which is a really good a good example for that. I know he plays darts and he kayaks and injures his shoulder a lot. I remember that, but I didn't know he plays the cello. Yeah, he played the cello in, in next gen. I don't think they carried it over to DS Nine, uh, but he did. He played the cello a handful of times on the original series. Uh, I'm sorry, not the original series, next gen, because of course everybody had. Uh, uh, an artistic side on next gen, right? Whether they mm-hmm. were doing theater or music or uh, or poetry or something else. Okay, yeah. that's true. I, I've been noticing as I started, uh, I started pinging social media. I was actually pleasantly surprised to see how many people playing Star Trek Adventures are playing non-commissioned officers, and they were they're doing it in the form of advisors, sometimes blended crews between two different polities, like a mixed Federation uh, Klingon Cardassian ship. Um, people even brought on medical personnel that were not commissioned officers. For instance, you know, despite what what we may think, because we've been watching her for fifty years, five years. Dr. McCoy was not a commissioned Starfleet officer, correct? Uh, correct. Yeah, he didn't attend the academy. He was uh, he he came in. I mean, I, I guess he came in as a civilian, and then they gave him a uh, like a brevet commission to to commander. Um, I don't know if that was an honorary. I, I mean, I don't remember the details, but uh, he did not attend the academy. So technically, he did, he was not you know in in the same rank scheme as everybody else. Yeah, yeah, so technically, he's actually the longest running first person who didn't have rank <laughs> that was on the show. I mean, if you think about it, 
technically from that point. I'm encouraging people. It was in the player's guide where they had a lot of those options available, political liaison, advisors, experts um, to to go that route um, and design games around that to expand your universe of play outside of the commissioned officers. What kind of conflicts could come up? Uh, I like to, you know, give game masters some, some chance to riff and kind of think about what are the benefits from a conflict point of view in having non-commissioned officers on board and part of the command crew, as it were, the senior staff. There's all kinds of potential. Um, you've got the, the, you're torn between the Federation ideals and the military test, uh, I guess, pseudo paramilitary stuff that Starfleet does when you've got the Federation scientist and the Starfleet officer, uh, you can, you can come up with a lot of conflict between captain and, and some other crew members and whatnot. Uh, in the Europa game, we've got a lot of, we, we don't do secondary characters quite the same way that everybody else does. We kind of, everyone plays their secondary characters. Um, and we've got a couple of secondary ones, one of which is a, a, a bartender named Teketh. He's a, a Vulcan quote unquote Vulcan, but he turned out to be a Romulan spy. And that was kind of an interesting way to catalyst things in there. And we got a lot of that, um, tension there with that character and and so there's a lot of potential for what you can do uh as far as the the inner inner conflict um again you come to, to carol marcus um she's a secondary character although she may can be considered more of an npc but um she definitely has the control over reliant um setting reliant to do tasks here and there and that can conflict with the various things that the, the captain of that ship wants to do and you can put a lot of pressure on you could add a lot of time pressure, I think, when you start adding those characters in. Totally. Yeah. I I I have to put the plug in again for the Vanguard series. For those of you who don't have not read that yet, but book four introduces Carol Marcus, which was a surprise to me in her early days. Um, and uh, but again, adding a depth to that character who I love uh so much uh is is just wonderful with that. Yeah, so Jim, think, oh go ahead. I was gonna say I think I think conflict is the is 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 really what it is. And you know, and I'm talking like, you know, fisticuffs or physical combat. You can have social conflict, right? In fact, that's a key component of the game. And uh when you when you bring two characters or you know, you bring characters together that aren't of the same organization and have different priorities and have different expectations, different needs, et cetera, that's gonna create a natural conflict of some form. So that like traditionally, like on like uh, you know, next gen and and the original series everybody was in starfleet so they all had kind of the same overlying goal in mind and that and that's why i i remember the writers i think probably ron moore said that it was hard to write for those characters because there was no conflict right mm-hmm. they were they were a happy family and there was not really any ability to butt heads with each other and and so that's why you always constantly see the 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 like the guest stars are often the adversaries of the week because they're the ones who can actually generate conflict with the with mm-hmm. the crew and i think it was it was really interesting i think one of the reasons i appreciate ds9 so much is because they, they changed it right they, they put kira and odo and quark as main key characters in that show who they didn't care about starfleet they were they didn't want anything to do with star i mean you know some of them didn't want anything to do. they had their own agendas they had their own goals they had their own aspirations and and they had to work hand in hand with the starfleet people that were there and just figure out how, how are we going to make this work and uh, I love that as a as a as a game master and as a player. I love being able to bounce that stuff off of um, my fellow players, and uh, to be able to do that. I mean, doing that in in Star Trek Adventures anyway means uh, you have the opportunity to play characters that you that you see on the show on the shows that aren't Starfleet, right? You don't have to do mm-hmm. Starfleet. You can, you can do yeah. whatever you want. And uh, fortunately, the game has progressed now after six years that we've given you more options. To do that, like you know, species, polities, uh, different roles, non-Starfleet roles, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I mean, the, you could do it in the the original core book, um, and I tried to emphasize that the first couple of years I was involved in the game. But like, a, a lot of gamers really struggled to 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 break out of that mold because what they saw on the page was Starfleet and right. and, um, and and like I, I knew the ingredients were there in the system, and I know other people did too. But uh, it just took us time to develop more products to get those options out there. I actually wanted to ask you though, that was the question I was going to ask is when you were originally developing it, was that cut or was it something like, Hey, if we can fit it in there, or is that something that developed after that idea firmly developed after you, the core rule book came out? Oh gosh, Michael, that's a great question. I, uh, 
I don't think I have an answer for you because uh, mm. I wasn't, I wasn't really working on the nuts and bolts of the system that far back. I was, I, was, I wrote the introduction, I wrote some sidebars and some other stuff, and then I just rapidly got into editing the uh, the first adventure book. Um, I don't think, and, and like Nathan will have to call me on this. I don't think it was intentionally not included in the core book. I think the core book was always intended to be Starfleet focused. Because that's the core experience that you see on the shows, right? I mean, the vast majority of Star Trek is focused on a Starfleet crew um, or, or or Starfleet adjacent, right? Like, I think DS9 and Prodigy are probably the two outliers, um, although we, we didn't have Prodigy. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, 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 we've, as we've been talking, actually, I have to say no, because Voyager was all about blending the two crews. And then I was thinking back to enterprise too to paul was not starfleet neither was flocks and they also had makos on board yeah i was going to bring up to paul and how that's actually a good example of a way to have a character with the comedy I mean, yeah but but like but like ds9 like like kira not, i mean until the end kira and odo and quark and garrick very not starfleet right like very very polar differences from the rest like like the, the maquis were like Starfleet light, come on, you know. Mm, <laughs> they, they, yeah, they, they turned around pretty quick. I, I wish they had played that that plot thread out longer, but like by the end of the pilot, you know, Chakotay is the first officer, and like there was no conflict between him and Janeway. He was just making moon eyes at her for the whole series, <laughs> um, you know. So, uh, <laughs> okay. mechanically speaking, I think the books do a really good job. Even the first core book, I think, does a really good job of giving you the opportunity. Um, I mean, some players have a harder time thinking outside the box if it's, if it's not there on the written page. Right. Um, and that's, you know, especially newer players who don't have that uh, that wealth of experience to, to draw on necessarily. But I think it's definitely there. Um, it's definitely expanded on in later books, uh, like the player's guide and like that gives you more options. But you could you could get that that deep interpersonal non Starfleet conflict pretty easily from the just the core rule book. Um, and when you look at T'Pol, you see that she is Starfleet, but not Starfleet. And you have that interpolitical conflict with the Vulcans and everything else. It's something you could certainly pull off um, without having anything but the main core rule book. Uh, it just a little, a little outside thinking. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, my advice too is I know that in the two tabletop games I'm I'm running now, we have a couple people who know Starfleet well and a couple people who don't. And if I could have gone back to the session zero thinking about this, I may have had the people who know Star Trek play the Starfleet Claire characters and then give a backstory to the people who know nothing about Star Trek and say, "Oh, you're on the ship." It then makes it more believable when the Star Trek characters start talking about protocol and what should or should not be done, and them having this conflicting opinion about it um as a non-star trek person um so i could see star trek adventures really being built to bring those crews cohesively together over time as an option for game star trek, star trek is essentially the story of humanity right so when you start getting into other characters and things like that you kind of do stray away from some of the core elements of star trek but that's kind of what makes the conflict interesting is if you play these characters from outside uh the human the the combined human experience of what we see in Star Trek. Um, and I think session zero, you bring up session zero. It's a really good time to bring that kind of thing up. Like what do you want to get out of the character that you're going to be playing in this, in this game? Like you're playing a non-Starfleet character. You understand that there's going to be conflict with your character for being outside of this norm. And it could create conflict with other characters in this, uh, in this uh, homogeny of what the humanity has become. Are you prepared for that? And here's some things we can do to help make that conflict more interesting without hurting anyone's feelings, that kind of stuff. I think session zero is a really good time to bring that kind of stuff up and make it clear what you as a play, as, as a game master and what the players are going to get out of playing these non-standard characters. Yeah. And so again, someone may want to pull a Voyager and introduce a character deeper into the game, even beyond session zero and, and, you know, have like a seven of nine introduced later on. And that's something to take and consider maybe to stir stuff up. If, if it's getting a little boring, maybe your one of your characters is willing to play a second character who's non Starfleet or even swap out their current character um, and build around that. There's always uh, plenty of people on social media, people pitching their stories and, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this and that. And I love seeing all the feedback that they get from other players um testing out those ideas so if if you're wondering how to how to work it put it up on facebook reddit discord wherever and ask about it right yeah just to just try to ignore the haters right just uh uh because like i mean all, I, those those posts to me are interesting because 
And, and I try not to respond to all of them because ultimately what I'm going to say is, yeah, that sounds great. Do it. Mm-hmm. You know, like any idea you come up with, make it work. It's going to be awesomely cool in the game. Just do it and have fun. Right. Like don't, you don't need somebody else's validation to, to go do something cool. Just like if you and your players come up with something awesome and, and doesn't feel like it would fit in the show, do it anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, what's the worst that can happen and maybe it doesn't work and then you just swap out the character and do something different um right. but the, every idea is awesome and <laughs> they all have a they all have a place they all have a place in the show and, and in the game so uh go I, forth. Go I was i was literally just reading somewhere today on social media i forget it was but someone has a triple captain yeah. and all it does is coup its orders <laughs> i was cracking up laughing and then somehow the triple captain got kidnapped and then everyone took to it like a a pet and just went you know devastating to get it back i i asked them if they wrote that up because i wanted to read the entire story but i thought that was one of the you know again some people take themselves too seriously but if everyone had a blast and they and they're laughing which it sounds like they were then you you made a great gaming night for your for your people yeah totally totally yeah. So cool. All right. So supporting. So not we're not talking supporting characters. We're talking about playing other than Starfleet characters. Uh, let's finish up with a couple, you know, words on that. Again, I, I encourage people who like Star Trek. We now can say that in every series, there's been an example, whether it starts with Dr. McCoy or, you know, whether it goes all the way into the future with Discovery, where there are non Starfleet characters on the show. Um, and it makes for some really interesting conflict. So whether you're session zero or just getting a little bored with your game, uh, consider the player's guide. Of course, you pick it up and has a lot of details um, about how to create a non Starfleet character and how to make it interesting. But go for it. We want to hear your stories, Jim. And uh, Jim and then Jeff, what are your final words about that before we get to uh, gratitude? Yeah, sure. So I, I would just say, uh, you know, get creative with your uh, with your values and your focuses and your even your talent selection. Right. There's a wealth of talents at this point in the game's life to 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 get really uh, well-rounded and, and buried and, you know, make up your own, too. I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to create new talents based on the wealth of material that's already available but uh, especially your values and focuses are good places to to put interesting things on your character that aren't traditionally starfleet or klingon or whatever right so you know get get really creative and uh, you know lean into um these other television shows etc like i mean it, it should be clear that like a lot of the values that we've used in the game are derived from dialogue right like a, a character will tell you who they are just by you know, just listen to their words, and you can you can morph that into a into a into a value very easily. And uh, I I just love the idea of playing a non Starfleet character who has values diametrically not so much opposed to the Starfleet or to the Federation, but just very different priorities, right? And uh, what an interesting uh, uh, episode dilemma you might have where if the first officer player character is like, this is the Starfleet thing we're going to do, and then you're this is how I feel right here. And you're going to get values challenged constantly back and forth, maybe some, some opposition there, but uh, yeah, I mean, just be creative. And uh, I mean, really to, to quote Picard, the sky's the limit. There's, I don't think there's any character you couldn't play in Star Trek that we could, we couldn't fit into the game somehow with, with, with the rule set that we have available now. Not great. Jeff. Yeah. When you're working on getting your characters to fit in though, make sure that you're working with your party and not opposed to them. Your character doesn't necessarily fit into the storyline um by default because they're not starfleet but you, that doesn't mean you can't fit them in um it's very easy to get into a character where you are conflicting by design um and still be fun um, so it's it's important that you make sure that, you, that when you're building this character you're thinking about the fact that this is still a game and everyone needs to have a good time um, you you're on the outside looking in and that can be a perspective all of in itself that, that everyone can share on when you're telling your stories make sure that you're showing uh that kind of uh, growth for your character and things like that as well. Um, I think there's a ton of mechanics out there to be able to, to, to be able to do this. And there's a lot of examples you can get from the TV shows for sure. Um, but you're the, as, as Jim said, this, the guy's the limit. The imagination is, is untethered. You can do anything you want to do. Um, just make sure that you're not doing something that is fundamentally going to make the game worse for someone else. Um, I think. Yeah. That, always. Yeah, that, I think, always so. Yeah. I think that's, that's a good point, Jeff. And I think, uh, I'd emphasize, you know, that session zero would be really super important. I mean, it's already important, but like, like really get, get the, get the, get everybody on the same page in that session zero, especially if somebody's thinking about playing a child, 
uh, right? Because you want to you want to get into the weeds a little bit and make sure, like you know, as far as like what's acceptable, what's not acceptable at the game table, and then think about creative ways that you could do that. Like we haven't really talked about kids playing kids um, in this uh, in this episode, but uh, be creative with that too. Play play a play a child AI, right? Like mm-hmm. a, sentient, a sentient AI, but you're a child. You get the child mentality, or you're literally a child, or you know, play a play a child Cosmozoan. Who uh, who follows the ship around and gets into hijinks or whatever? But uh, uh, I mean, really lean into the science fiction of the franchise, right? And think think big and think futuristic, and uh, you know, pull your favorite science fiction novel off the shelf or favorite uh, favorite science fiction short story, and uh, just just think big and and get really creative and have fun. Yeah, I mean, I'll invite one other thing, too, is maybe you want to play a non-Starfleet character, but more in a Luwak Swan, a Troy kind of way where, you know what, I, every year I just want to play this character about five or six times and slowly <laughs> develop them uh, yeah. over time. So uh-huh. you could, for those of you who want to play multiple characters, like you can't get enough of it, ask your game master, hey, you know what, I want to play these recurring characters. I want to play the hologram and the holodeck every so often, or I want to play an advisor or the irritating admiral who comes by once every five episodes so um that's a great way to introduce non-starfleet characters and get your feel of playing multiple characters by design with your game master yeah you come back to your hometown on college break or something you mm-hmm. get two weeks to play that character that everybody hates but everybody loves to see you there so uh you get yeah. to play the, the kai win or the uh the barkley the reginald barkley, the barkley yeah yeah that'd Great be fun characters yeah Yeah, I know I do that. I play two characters on uh, my game because we rotate through game masters now. And I play the quartermaster, the ship's quartermaster, who acts is the wife of the captain. And I also play a sentient hologram um, on on recurrence. And it's been so fun when I get to play those characters. Um, And, you know, they're in the background. Other times they'll be mentioned in a couple paragraphs. So, you know, they're there. But then every so often they get a starring a co-starring role. And that's a fun way to get all the player player out of my system when i want to play Mm -hmm. all right cool oh star trek adventures so many different ways to play so many facets of the game so let's do thank yous again gratitude i'll go ahead and start with the brick and mortar this time we have mark compton a star trek super fan fantastic role player too um and he suggests game on in chattanooga tennessee jeff who's your gratitude to Oh, that's a good question. Um, I forgot we do gratitude, so I didn't think it through. Um, uh, I mean, I have, I have a lot of gratitude for, uh, I mean, we've said the fans before, um, but there's a lot of, I've, I've had some new customers come into my store. I also own a, a gaming store and I've mm-hmm. had some new customers come to the store who have been really good about getting me to think more openly about um, the role-playing thing in general. And I think one thing that has been really good uh, I, I basically my gratitude is I want to thank the customers who have been in, who have been um, so enthusiastic about trying new things. And I've got, I've been able to get a couple of them into um, Star Trek adventures um, and the, to be able to see the joy in a new player's eyes. I don't, it's not something I see very often anymore because I've got a gaming group that's been around for a long time. When, a, when a player discovers a new game and they really are excited by it, I think that's invigorating. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to everyone who is giving Star Trek adventures and other new games a try with all the things that are going on in the RPG community. And I think it's really big. And I'm, I'm, I am genuinely grateful uh, for the opportunity to, to see and experience new players, points of view things like that. So and, uh, can you please plug your game store for us? <laughs> uh, it's Adventure Inc. Uh, we're in Milan, Michigan, which is just north of Toledo, just south of Ann Arbor. You can find us at adventureinc.xyz. The website store is not online yet, but it is inching ever closer to being done. So why and why is your store not a mentioned sponsor at the ending of every one of our shows? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can we make that happen, please? All right. <laughs> all right, Jim, your gratitude and take us out. Uh, yeah, I want to thank um, all the uh, all the writers, all the actors, all the producers, all the developers of all the Star Trek shows who uh, who who took the leap to create non Starfleet characters and get them on the shows to show us those different perspectives. Uh, to help make the franchise just a more well-rounded universe in which to play. So it's not just Starfleet all the time. It's like there's so much more to it. So I'm grateful that uh, grateful for them for expanding the universe and giving us such a fertile ground in which to role play. Um, and then uh, thanks to Jeff for all you do behind the scenes. Um, I know you probably do a whole lot more work than we ever see. So thank you.
Take yeah. that. Always appreciate you. And uh, I would be, of course, remiss if I didn't thank the fans. So thank you to all the fans out there of the game, of the franchise. Uh, we couldn't do this game without you. Uh, we wouldn't be doing it without you. So uh, you're keeping it alive. I see your posts on uh, all the different social media platforms. I see how supportive you are of new fans coming into it. And I can't thank you enough for that because, um, uh, you know, you're doing you're doing the lion's share of the work, right? We're converting one new fan at a time. and. Uh, you know, Medivius can only do so much of that, right? Like it's really up to any, any healthy game is going to be up to the fan base. Like if the fan base is healthy, the game's healthy. If the fan base doesn't care, then the, the game dies on the vine. So uh, that's I'm right. happy, happy to see Star Trek Adventures living, living well here. So uh, that's right. I'm playing another tabletop game on Sunday with a group and we introducing a new player. So I'm looking Woo. forward to growing us again uh, a little bit of time. And I'm happy to say that one of my players who's only played twice has now asked permission to GM a game. So we're going to be Woo. building a game together. So we've just bred another bread. I should say we've just birthed or created another GM. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the key right there. I mean, it's wonderful to, to create more players, of course the the real key is getting more game masters right because the game masters will then spawn more players and and so on and so forth so exactly. but any, any, anything's anything's a plus so thank you okay fantastic everyone until next time idic uh be safe be well live long and prosper we will see you all next time <laughs>